Good morning, everyone. If you will turn your Bibles to Amos chapter 3 this morning. Children are now dismissed to junior church for this time. And those who are remain will turn to uh, Amos chapter 3. We've been going through the, some minor prophets. We started last week looking at the book of Amos. And we'll continue uh, this week and next. And then we'll get right into, I believe, Obadiah after this. In our previous study, we began our survey of the book of Amos, a prophet of God who was a country shepherd and gatherer of sycamore fruit. He was called to proclaim God's judgment on the nations, especially the nation of Israel as a whole. This book is divided into three sections. Last time we looked at the oracles concerning sin and judgment of the eight nations in chapters 1 and 2. We know from last week, oracles are basically prophecies of the eight nations that surround or make up, I should say, the nation of Israel, the northern tribes and the southern tribes. This week, this week we're going to look at the sermons according, the sermons, excuse me, concerning the sin and judgment of, of Israel, chapters 3 through 6. Next week, we'll look at the visions regarding the sin and judgment of Israel in chapter 7 through 9, and that will complete the book of Amos at that time. In his oracles, we saw that God pronounced judgment upon heathen nations nations such as Damascus and Gaza and Tyre, Edom, Ammon, Moab, people of God, both Judah and Israel. When When I pronounce or when I mention the names Judah and Israel. We know from last week studying this that when I, when I talk about the nation of Judah, that's the southern kingdom. The nation of Israel is the northern kingdom. After Solomon ruled and was king, the nation was divided. Solomon's sons, Jeroboam and Rehoboam, took ten tribes to the north and basically created their own civilization up there. And they set up the capital the, the capital at that time was Bethel, B-E-T-H-E-L, that they set up up in the northern kingdom. And of course, in the southern kingdom, we left with Judah and a little tribe called Benjamin. And they just basically com- com- uh, compacted each other, and we know that from the, the, the southern kingdom, or we know that from when we look at Judah as a whole. <clears throat> now this oracles that we looked at last time with was emphasis placed upon the sins and judgments of the northern kingdom of Israel as a whole. In this lesson, however, we're going to direct our attention to the sermons in chapter 3 through 6. These are, there are three sermons, each beginning with the hear this word, chapter 3, chapter 4, and chapter 5. The focus of these sermons is, is Israel in the kingdom in the north. So let's pray before we get into the passage of Scripture. Father, we are so blessed to be called your sons and daughters. Lord, we are so blessed to be called your servants. Lord, we are so blessed to know you as our personal Lord and Savior. And Father, as we come to you before uh, your throne this morning, as we sing worship songs to you, and I pray that you are glorified. And Lord, as we turn our attention to the word, to your word, primarily focused here in the Old Testament book of Amos, a prophetic book at that time and even going forward to our time today. Help us to gather some truths from it that we can learn and apply these truths to our lives that we won't make the same mistakes the nation of Israel made that you cast sin and judgment upon uh, them. And Father, I pray that you would Bless us in a mighty way this morning as we look at your word, as we um, uh, try to bring honor and glory to you. I pray that you will be honored and glorified. Speak through me in a mighty way this morning and prepare the hearts, open the hearts to hear what you would have us hear. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. In chapter 3 of Amos, we uh, look, begin. I'm going to go right, the way I'm going to do this this morning, we're going to go right through 
these chapters. We're not going to read the whole chapter as a whole. We're going to go right through and point out verse by verse, line by line, as we look at this, these, these chapters, these sermons, if you will call them. The first sermon is the doom of Israel. Chapter 3, verse 1 through 15. Here we see Amos defends his right to prophesy. We see that in chapter 3, verse 1 and 2. It says, Hear this word that the Lord has spoken against you, O children of Israel, against the whole family which I brought up from the land of Egypt, saying, You only have I known of all the families of the earth. Therefore I will punish you for all your iniquities. Now let's just stop right there for a minute. God's saying to the nation of Israel as a whole, I've known you. I've I've had a personal relationship with you. No other nation in the world at that time can God say that about. We know from Scripture that that the nation of Israel is the apple of God's eye. Amen? And so we know that he had a personal relationship with them. He chose them from all the nations of the world at that time, he chose them to work with, work with and work in and through. So the Lord has spoken against Israel, we see here in verse 1 and 2, with whom he has a, has a special relationship, with whom he know, now will punish for their sins. So much is, required, much is uh, given, much is what? Required. We know that from Scripture. The nation of Israel has given much. They were blessed by God. They were, they were held up by God. They, were, they defeated armies because of God. The land that they had and was given was but right from God himself. He said, because I've known you, therefore I will punish you. <laughs> Seven questions we see here in chapters, chapter 3, verse 3 through 6 with obvious answers. Let's look at chapter 3, verse 3. Can two walk together unless they are agreed? Will a lion roar in the forest when he has no prey? Will a young lion cry out of his den if he has caught nothing? Will a bird fall into a snare on the earth where there is no trap for it? Will a snare spring up from the earth if it has caught nothing at all? If a trumpet is blown in a city, would not the people be afraid? If there is calamity in a city, will not the Lord have done it? You see, the purpose and the meaning of these questions have been variously interpreted, but their intent appears to enforce the logic of what follows in the next two verses, verses 7 through 8. Surely the Lord God God does nothing unless he reveals his secret to his servants, the prophets. A lion has roared, who will not fear. The Lord God has spoken, who can but prophesy? God, he says here, can a man, can a prophet remain silent when God speaks? I firmly would say no. A prophet, a true prophet of God, a true servant of God, called by God, cannot remain silent when God God speaks. And folks, I'm telling you, God's speaking right now. He's trying to get us to wake up. And he's speaking, and I, and I believe he's speaking through some godly men. And I pray that I'm one of them. And, and you can see here that he's really referring to himself, Amos is, and he's giving some, some background, some authority behind his words that he's going to share over the next several chapters. So there's a reason why he says that, but he's really making a point, making a statement Surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secret to his servants, the prophets. And he's, what he's saying is, the next several verses, the next several chapters, I'm going to reveal these secrets to you, nation of Israel. So listen up. I'm going to say, dare I say, folks, church, United States of America, listen up. Because he's going to reveal some secrets to us. The Lord does nothing unless he reveals it to one of his prophets. Like a lion that has roared, God has spoken, and Amos must prophesy. 
We see here Israel's doom in chapter 3, verse 9 through 10. Proclaim the palaces, proclaim in the palaces at Ashdod, in the palaces in the land of Egypt, and say, assemble on the mountains of Samaria. See great tumults in, their, in her midst, and the oppressed within her, for they do not know to do right, says the Lord, who store up violence and robbery in their palaces. Ashdod and Egypt are called to witness Israel's wickedness. Israel will be plundered by an adversary. How do we know that? Verse 11 through 15. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, an adversary shall be all around the land. He shall sap your strength from you, and your palaces shall be plundered. Thus says the Lord, as a shepherd takes from the mouth of a lion two legs or a piece of an ear, so shall the children of Israel be taken out who dwell in Samaria. In the corner of a bed, and on the edge of a couch, hear and testify against the house of Jacob, says the Lord God, the God of hosts, that in that day I punish Israel for their transgressions. I will also visit destruction on the altars of Bethel, and the horns of the altar shall be cut off and fall to the ground. I will destroy the winter house along with the summer house. The houses of ivory shall perish, and the great houses shall shall have no, an end, says the Lord. Through, through never identified by Amos, Isaiah declared that it will be Assyria that these talk about here, the nations around them, will come in and destroy them. Concerning Israel's punishment, coming punishment, only a remnant will survive of those who dwell in luxury. Like a piece of a lamb left after, over after being ravaged by a lion, there's always going to be a remnant. God promised that to the nation of Israel. God promised that, I believe, to us today. If you look around, if you really look around this culture today, as a majority, of, as a whole, let's just look at the nation, the, the, the nation of the United States of America right now. As a nation, and the nation as a whole, there's only a few individuals, a select few let's just say millions, okay, <laughs> that are really desiring for the Lord and desiring for His will to be accomplished in their life. Living a life of righteousness. That really care about what, what pleases the Lord God and what doesn't. God always will have a remnant. And folks, that really does give us hope. Even when we are taken out in the rapture, God's going to raise up some leaders right out from the tribes of Jacob. And it's going to start out with several witnesses. Then that's going to grow and grow and grow. So you have 144,000 Jews sealed with the Holy Spirit and power. I can't wait to stand up and sit up there in heaven and watch all this happen. It's going to be something special. There's always going to be a remnant. And that's what he's referring to. I'm, you're, you're going to be taken captive. And, we're, and he really doesn't say Assyria, but we know from, from future books written in Chronicles, Kings, we know that that's what happened. The Assyrians came in and took the nation of Israel captive. But there was a remnant that was left. Destruction will come upon the altars of Bethel. Why is that? We know from Scripture, other places, and other references, that's from Jeroboam, his idolatry. Jeroboam was a wicked man. Destruction will also befall their lux luxurious homes. We know that from other Scripture references as well, that when the nation of Israel was taken in captivity, the nation was destroyed. The cities were destroyed. Bethel was destroyed. The, cap the capital, the, the Samaria was destroyed. So with this first sermon, we see destruction is pronounced upon Israel. The sin of the, some of the men was mentioned earlier in chapter 2, 6 through 8. But the next sermon, we see the wickedness of the women. So here we see the wickedness of the men. Now we're going to turn our, our attention to...
to the wickedness of the woman. Let's look at chapter 4, verse 1 and 2 and 3. Hear this word, O you, you cows of Bashan, who are on the mountain of Samaria, who oppress the poor, who crush the needy, who say to your husbands, bring, bring wine, let us drink. The Lord God has sworn by his holiness. Behold, the day shall come upon you when he will take you away with fish hooks and your, and your posterity with fish hooks. You will go out through broken walls, each one straight ahead of her, and you will cast, be cast into Harmon, says the Lord. Now, <clears throat> we see the depravity of the women of Israel as the next sermon title here as we go through this section. Now, he uses a term that you as women should really be offended by, um, and it's the term of cows of Bashan. Here, Amos calls the women of Israel at that time cows. And if you understand the, the, the context around this, it's because the cows of Bashan, the, the reference really are, it says they are insatiable. These are Israelite women in Samaria particularly that are really like trendsetters of the society. Leaders of the society. Women who, gra who graze upon the best of the land. Do you know any of those? We might call them today aristocrats. Heiresses. Heiresses. H-E-I-R-E-S-S-S. -S -S, you know. We might call them, and we don't really want to mention any names in our, in our public society, but we might think, think of some of those women in our society that just are high up there, and they just graze upon the best and luxury of the world that has to offer. And really, if you think about it and you're, we're honest with each other, they're the leaders in our society. They're not good leaders, Amen. But they are the leaders in our society. Young women who come up and they look at that and say, I want to be just like them. If you don't know who I'm referring to, can I say maybe like the Kardashians? Girls. Girls, little girls, all the way up to teenage girls, look at them and say, that's what I'm going to be. I'm going to be just like that. That's who the, these cows of Bashan are. They graze upon the best of the land. They oppress the poor and needy. Amos chapter 4, verse 1. They cry out for wine, verse 2, for which they will suffer painful deportation to a foreign land. We see that in verse 3. They're going to have their due, Amos is saying. They like to wear their jewelry. They like to have all that, that gaudy stuff. That, and it says here that they're going to be taken captivity through with fish hooks in their mouth and their, in their nose. And if we, if we read Scripture further, that does happen. So we see the cows of Bashan, they are insatiable. Secondly, a sarcastic call to worship we see that in verse 4 through 5. Come to Bethel and transgress. At Gilgal, at, at Gilgal, multiply transgression. Bring your sacrifices every morning. Your tithes every three days. Offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving with leaven. Proclaim and announce the free will of offerings. For this you love, you children of Israel, says the Lord God. Here we see a sarcastic call to worship their false gods at Bethel and Gilgal, designed to show how far they have departed from God. These women, and what the Lord's saying, these women will say, false worship, come and do this. Come and do this. Come and see. Come, be just like me. And God says, whoa, whoa time out. No. Here we see they had rejected God's chastisement. Verse 6 to 13. Also, I gave you cleanliness of teeth in all your city, a lack of bread in all your places. 
yet you have not returned to me, says the Lord. Let's talk about famine. Seven through eight, talk about drought. I, will, I also withheld rain from, your, from you with, when there were, were still three months to harvest. I made a rain on, on one city and withheld rain for another city. One part was rained upon, and where it did not rain, the part withered. So two or three cities wandered to another city to drink water, but they were not satisfied. Yet you have not returned to me, says the Lord. We see pestilence in verse 9. I blasted you with blight and mildew. When your gardens increased, your vineyards, your fig trees, and your olive trees, the locusts devoured them, yet you have not returned to me, says the Lord. Plagues and wars in verse 10. I sent among you a plague after the manner of Egypt. Your young men I I killed with a sword, along with your captive horses. I made the stretch... I made the stench of your camps come upon, come up into your nostrils. Yet you have not returned to me, says the Lord. Earthquakes, or perhaps volcanic eruptions, we see in verse 11. I overthrew some of, your, some, some of you as God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah, and you were like a first firebrand plucked from the burning, yet you, yet you have not returned to me. Therefore thus will I do to you, O Israel, because I will do this to because I will do this to you, prepare to meet your God, O Israel. For behold, he who forms mountains and creates the wind, who declares to man what his thought is, and makes the morning darkness, who treads the high places of the earth, the Lord God of hosts is his name. So because of all these things mentioned in verses six through eleven. Therefore, they must prepare to meet their God. Now, I'm going to go back to chapter 3, verse 1 again. One minute here. It says, verse 2, You only have I known of all the families of the earth. Therefore, I will punish you for all your iniquities. Now, keep that verse in mind because that's key going forward here. Because of this, because the Lord has known them out of all the families of of the world, He's known them. He has a special relationship with them. He holds them at high, to a higher standard. Because of all this, he's referring this whole chapter 4, he's talking about the women of, of uh, the cows of Bashan, the women of Israel, and how they have just led the other women, and even some of the men, into destruction. And in verse 12, he says, prepare to meet your God, O Israel. Now he's lumping them all into the same camp. The men, the women, Israel as a whole, lumping them into the same camp. So in light of such a judgment to befall Israel, is it not surprising to see that the third sermon is in the form of of a lamentation? Chapter 5 starting in verse 1, all the way through chapter 16, verse 14. We see the third sermon. And the third sermon is a dirge or a, lem- or a lament over Israel. We see a lamentation for the house of Israel in chapter 5, verse 1 through 3. Hear this word which I have taken, which I take up against you, a lamentation, lamentation O house of Israel. The virgin of Israel has fallen. She will rise no more. She lies forsaken on her land. There is, one, there is no one to raise her up. For thus says the Lord God, the city that goes out by a thousand shall have a hundred left, and that which goes out by a hundred shall have ten left to the house of Israel. We see here in view of her coming fall, the limitations in the view of her coming fall in verse 1 and 2, in which also will be a remnant that we left we see there in verse 3. Then we see a call to repentance for there is still hope in verse 4 through 15. For thus says the Lord to the house of Israel, seek me and live. But do not seek Bethel, nor enter Gilgal, nor pass over to Beersheba, for Gilgal shall surely go into captivity. And Bethel shall come to nothing. Seek the Lord and live, 
lest he break out like, like fire in the house of Joseph and devour it, with no one to quench it in Bethel. Who, you who turn justice to wormwood and lay righteousness to rest in the earth. He made the Pleiades and Orion. He turns the shadow of death into morning and makes the day, day dark as night. He calls the waters from the, for the waters of the sea and pours them out on the face of the earth. The Lord is his name. He rains ruin upon the strong so that fury comes upon the fortress. They hate the one who rebukes in the gate. And they abhor the one who speaks uprightly. Therefore, because you tread down the poor and take grain taxes from him, though you have built houses of honed stone, yet you shall not dwell in them. You have planted pleasant vineyards, but you shall not drink wine from them. For I know your manifold transgressions and your mighty sins, afflicting the just and taking bribes, diverting the poor from justice at the gate. Therefore, the prudent keep silent at that time, for it is an evil time. Seek good and not evil, that you may live. So the Lord God of hosts will be with you as you have spoken. Hate evil, love good, establish justice in the gate. It may be, it may be that the Lord God of hosts will be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. So we see the call to repentance here from Amos to the nation of Israel as a whole. It says, Seek the Lord and live, lest he comes with fiery judgment, verse 4 through 7. Seek him who is all powerful, verse 8 through 9. For he knows your manifold sins, verse 10 through 13. Seek that which is good, not evil. Perhaps God will be gracious, verse 14 through 15. Can I say amen? There's what I call to repentance, even for us today in this nation that we're living in. All these things that Amos is talking about, we here as a church in the nation that we have freedom to live and dwell to really take in consideration what he's talking about here. Seek the Lord and live, lest he comes in with fiery judgment. Seek him who is all-powerful, for, for he knows your manifold sins. He knows the sins that we have here. The sins of abortion, the sins of killing, the sins, the sins of human trafficking. We have lost the most human decency is the right to life of unborn babies, of boys and girls, teenagers, women that are being sold for slaves. Just the, the normal human decency, we've lost that. And you think the Lord's just up there going to be silent about it? We're foolish if we think that, amen? There's judgment coming. Seek that which is good, not evil. Perhaps God will be gracious. Amen. We talk about, we see the coming day of the Lord, verse 16 and 17. Therefore the Lord, God of hosts, the Lord says this, there shall be wailing in all streets, they shall be, they, and they shall say in all the highways, Alas, alas, they shall come, call the farmer to mourning, and skill for lamenters to wailing. In all, the, in all vineyards there shall be wailing, for I will pass through you, says the Lord. He says, The Lord is coming, and there shall be wailing in the streets and fields. The day of the Lord is not to be desired by sinful men. We see that in verse 18 to 27. It says, Woe to you who desire the day of the Lord, for what good is it the day of the Lord to you? It will be darkness and not, not light. It will be as though a man fled from a lion and a bear met him, as though he went into the house, leaned his hand on the wall, and a serpent bit him. Is it not the day of the Lord, darkness and not light? Is it not dark, very dark with no brightness in it? I hate I despise your, your feast days and do not savor your sacred assemblies. Though you offer me burnt offerings and your grain offerings, I will not accept them, nor will I regard your fattened peace offerings. Take away from me the noise of your songs. 
for I will not hear the melody of your stringed instruments. But let justice run down like water, and righteousness like a mighty stream. Did you offer me sacrifices and offerings? In the wilderness forty years, O house of Israel. You also carry Sikuth, your king, and Chuanth, your idols, and the star of your gods, which you made for yourselves. Therefore I will send into you into the captivity beyond Damascus, says the Lord, whose name is the God of hosts. Now, he asks a question that I think is pretty in- interesting. In verse 18. Woe to you who desire the day of the Lord. Now, I believe that there's two groups of people that he's talking about here. Those who are know Christ, those who are desiring the day of the Lord, that are, they know that when he comes, he's going to take us home. And the other group of people that have no clue, but they're fascinated by end times things. They're fascinated by Armageddon. They're fascinated by zombies. That's all apocalyptic things. Amen? And people are fascinated and look forward to that day. They, they have video games designed to shoot zombies. Because they're looking forward to that. I can't wait to get my M16 out and go zombie hunting. Come on. Do you understand what that's going to look like in that day? They have no clue because they haven't read the Bible. Now, I don't think that it was that, that way in Amos' day that they were had video games designed to shoot zombies. That's supposed to be funny. You guys can laugh now. Good, good, you're awake. I'm not saying that that's what it was. I'm saying that in their day, I think they were still looking forward to that day, that there was like this mystical thing going to happen when the day of the Lord came. For what good is the day of the Lord to you? It will be darkness and not light. It would be as though a man fled from a lion and a bear with Adam, met him. As though he went into the house where safety was, leaned on his hand and the hand on the wall, and a servant bit him. There's a false sense of what? Security. I believe he's also talking about those who have a false sense of security in their works, their own salvation, so to speak. They're not referring to the same gospel as we refer to. The same God that they serve is not the same God that's referring to here in Amos. So they're looking for this day of of judgment or this day of, uh, of the Lord, but their day of the Lord is different than our day of the Lord. So the day of the Lord is not to be desired by sinful man, for it will be a day of darkness. Verse 18 through 20. For God is repelled by their show of religion when there should be righteousness and justice. 21 through 24. For they have never really served God, even in the wilderness. 25 through 26. Therefore they will be taken beyond Damascus, it says, which really refer to as Assyria. Verses 25 through 27. And we see a warning even to those in Zion in chapter 6, verse 1 and 2. Woe to you who are at ease in Zion and trust in Mount Samaria. Notable persons in the chief nation to whom the house of Israel comes. Go over to Kalna and see. And from there go to Hamath the great. Then go down to Gath of the Philistines. Are you better than these kingdoms? Or is your territory greater than your ter- is, is their territory greater than your territory? So woe to those who are at ease trusting in Samaria or the northern kingdom of Israel, 
Amos chapter 6, one, verse 1 and 2, perhaps to defend them, perhaps consider what happened to the kingdom far greater. That's what he's referring to here in verses 1 through 3. Woe to those who say that the day of the Lord is far off. Let's look at verse 3 through 6. Woe to you who put far off the day of doom, who cause the seat of violence to come near, who lie on beds of ivory, stretch out on your couches, eat lambs from the flock and calves from the midst of the stall, who sing idly to the sound of stringed instruments and invent for yourselves musical instruments like David, who drink wine from bowls and anoint yourselves with the best ointments, but are not grieved, but are not grieved for the affliction of Joseph, Therefore, they shall now go captive as, as the first of the captivities, captives, and those who recline at banquets shall be removed. So we see a warning to those in Zion here. Woe to those who say the day of the Lord is far off, who bask in their luxury while their brethren are afflicted. Now who can that refer to in our today society? There are some religious leaders out there that will say, oh, the day of the Lord, that, that's far off. We got plenty of time. Just eat, drink, and be merry. But the Bible says, no, 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 no. The day of the Lord can happen tomorrow. It can happen before we even leave here today. The Lord can return like that. It says in Scripture, the Lord will return in like a twinkling of an eye, like a thief in the night. So today, today is the day of salvation, the Bible says. So you see the contrast. The contrast is just blaring in your face. They shall be among the first to go into captivity. Chapter 6, verse 7. Going back to chapter 3, verse 1. Too much is required. Too much is given. Much is required. Those leaders, those religious leaders that we call so-called religious leaders that are leading whole congregations into error, they will be taken first. Now, we know when you study prophecies, when you study the minor, pro book, minor prophets of the Bible, when you study the major pro prophets of the Bible, we think of Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel. Those are major prophets. Here we see Amos as a minor prophet, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Obadiah. Those are all minor prophets to name a few. But whenever you study prophecy, remember this. The, per, the prophet is prophesying for a, a very close future prophecy. So whenever you study prophecy, you're thinking of a close and far away approach. So there's something close going to happen that he's referring to here. A close prophecy is coming. A soon prophecy is coming. The nation of Israel at that time is will, be taken, will, will be taken into captivity very shortly. But it's also referring to a far prophecy. And because Christ came, because he died on the cross, because he was a Jew, because we as Gentiles are grafted into the Jewish faith, because we are all grafted into one. There is no Gentile or Jew anymore. There is just one in Christ. Because of that, we have the same benefits, the same blessings that he gave to Abraham. Amen? But also, the same commandments he gave to Abraham and to the nation of Israel as a whole, we must abide by. And the same judgments that were going to come to them if they don't do certain things, we will have the same judgments being faced upon our nation. Now, you cannot sit there, or no one can sit there and tell me that this is not talking about the United States of America, because it is. If we're going to follow down the same path the nation of Israel did, we will have the same judgment as they did. Period. So we cannot separate that. So the reason why we're preaching this is because we have to understand what did they do? Can we learn from history? I hope so. Amen? 
And this is history right there facing us. So we cannot, there's still a warning for those who are in Zion. I'm going to put that in parentheses. Those who think they're doing good. And Zion here is referring to the southern kingdom. Jerusalem. He's saying here, I'm, I'm speaking to the northern kingdom, to the nation of Israel, and, but, but hold on a minute. Do, you guys down the south, don't you think you're too high and mighty that this ain't going to affect you either? Because guess what? Later on, they go into captivity. Because they did the same thing the nation northern of them did. They didn't learn from the nation above them than, than their mistakes. Well, are we going to learn from the nation of Israel's mistakes? So far, we haven't. Too much is given, much is required. I firmly believe that's a biblical principle. So we see the extent of the destruction in verse 8. The Lord God has sworn by himself, the Lord God of hosts says, I abhor the pride of Jacob and hate his palaces. Therefore I will deliver up the city and all that is in it. Then I shall come to pass, if, they, if ten men remain in one house, they shall die. And when a relative of the dead, with one who will burn the bodies, picks up the bodies, Take him out of the house, he will say to one inside the house, Are there any more with you? Then someone will say, None. He will say, Behold your tongue, for we dare not mention the name of the Lord. For behold, the Lord gives a command, He will break the great house into bits, and the little house into pieces. Do horses run on rocks? Does one plow there with does one plow there with oxen? Yet you have turned justice into gall, and the fruit of righteousness into the worm, worm, wormwood. You who rejoice over Lodabar, who say, Have we not taken Karnem for ourselves by our own strength? But behold, I will raise up a nation against you, O house of Israel, says the Lord God of hosts, and they will afflict you from the entrance of Hamath, the valley of Arabah. So you see the extent of the coming of destruction. Coming because God hates their pride. We see that in verse 8. A destruction where men will be scarce and their houses destroyed, verse 9 through 11. Why? Because they perverted the justice and righteousness, priding themselves in their own strength, verse 12 through 13. Now, as we go through these, remember our nation today. But God will raise up a nation, Assyria, we know, against them, who will afflict them from the north. And that's where we get the entrance of Hamath. And to the south, the valley of Arabah. Amos chapter 6, verse 14. So ends the third of these three sermons of Amos. Before we conclude our study, let me share some observations from the sermons of Amon. The recurring themes of justice and righteousness. Several times we find references to justice and righteousness. Their opposites are also mentioned, oppression and evil. Lacking justice and righteousness, all their religion, wealth, and power were in vain. So it doesn't matter what we have, how blessed we are, if we don't have righteousness and justice, we're done. Now look around you. Do we have justice and righteousness prevailing? No. Why? Because the people that have justice and righteousness, that have the Holy Spirit living inside them, are not stepping up and standing strong. That's why. Amen? Israel's failure to heed God's chastisements is a second observation. That God used natural calamity to get their attention is evident in verses chapter 4, verse 6 through 11. Why did, why did they not heed God's efforts? Perhaps they did not make the connection. Perhaps they assumed it was just a coincidence. One would be amiss to always attribute natural calamities to God's workings. Yet, should we not be open to the possibility that God may be saying something? Should we not at least use such occasions to reflect on the relationship with God? I've been trying to do that as I preach, to take this calamity, take this pandemic, so to speak, and use it to turn our hearts back to God. Maybe he's just trying to get our attention to slow down 
Let's refocus where our attention should be. Amen? I know it did that for me. It, allowed, it helped me to slow down and focus my attention where it should be. Third observation is regarding the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is a day of judgment, a day of darkness. Chapter 5, verse 18. In Amos, it was as, as a reference to God's judgment upon Israel, which came when Assyria took them into captivity. But such judgment pre prefigures the final judgment, the day of the Lord, in which Christ will come to judge the world, Acts chapter, chapter 17, 30 to 31. It, will, it, it too will be a day of darkness. We see that in 2 Peter chapter 3. While we might not desire that day per se, we do look forward to what is to follow in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 13 through 14. The fourth observation is God's gracious offer of repentance. Even with the pronouncements of judgment, there is an offer to have life if one re repents. We see that in Amos chapter 5, uh, 4 through 6, and verse 14 through 15. As we saw, <clears throat> as we will see with Joel and, Ju and Jonah, God will be willing to relent for those. God will be willing to, willing to re um, listen to those who repent. Even today, while, we, while the gospel proclaims judgment to come, it also offers salvation. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, 1 through 2. So in closing, unfortunately, not many heeded the warnings of Amos. We know that by, if you read 2 Kings chapter 17, we will see that. Within 30 years, Israel has taken into captivity after this announcement was made. Under the cruel hand of the Assyrians, they experienced the righteous judgment of God. What about us? Will we heed the warnings of Christ and his apostles? Their message is really not the, that different. Seek the Lord and live. Seek good and not evil. They too call upon us to repent and seek the Lord through faith and obedience. Though it is obedience to the gospel of Christ and not the law of Moses. Remember the book of Amos along with the rest of the Old Testament was written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Are we willing to learn from his admonition, such as those found in the prophecies of Amos? Let's pray. Father, I, pray, I thank you, Lord, for your word. And even this Old Testament book from this country prophet is so powerful. It's such a reminder of who you are. And as we are given much, much is required of us to live a godly life, a life that pleases and honors you in every moment of our day. And Lord, if there's one here that has been touched by this message and that you've spoken to regarding what's required of them, maybe you've touched them and given them a desire to maybe change some things in their life, I pray, Lord, that you would follow through with that and, and continue to convict and prod and, pro and probe and just give them a desire to change and help them to do that, Lord. Lord, today is a day for us to get serious about our relationship with our Heavenly Father, relationship with you that we have through your Son. And Father, I pray that each one here can honestly say, that they know you. Lord, if there's one here that does not know you, does not have the Holy Spirit or promise living inside of them, I pray they will not leave this place. They will talk to me so they can get that squared away. Bless us as we close up this section, this series of messages. I pray that as we continue throughout the week looking at this section, studying it, looking up scripture references that I gave, that you opened our eyes to, to see even more detail in, this, in, the, in your word. And we praise you for this. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Please stand, if you will, and join in the singing of hymn 653. Whiter than snow, we're doing verses one and four, six, five, three. <laughs> 